Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Crohn's Fitness Food Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Gish, Crohn's Warrior and IGA Nephropathy Warrior, and I'm dedicated to sharing the stories of those with IBD. Thank you so much for joining me today. Now let's get to it. Well, hi, everyone. My guest today is Stephanie Lewis, a Crohn's warrior who's been battling symptoms for over 30 years and is passionate about helping women over 50 get their autoimmune and other inflammatory illnesses under control. She's a creator of the Longevity Blueprint, is certified in training and nutrition, and is an NLP practitioner. Thank you so much for joining me today, Stephanie, and welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Stephanie. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. So I've actually, I've been following you for a little while on Instagram, and I love the posts that you're doing, um, covering everything from just fitness and food and NLP. So we're going to get into a lot of stuff. We've got a lot of ground to cover today, but why don't you go ahead and start us off by sharing your Crohn's story. You've had symptoms for a long time, um, over 30 years. So take us through that journey from symptoms up through your diagnosis. Okay. Well, I was actually born sick. I was born with a colon that didn't pulse correctly and it didn't even have a name back then. This was, I was born in 1961. Uh, so I have always had, my stomach has always hurt. I have always had digestive issues. I don't, I, I've always been bloated. <laughs> I've always been bloated. And if you have Crohn's disease and you know, I've always had food problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've always had food problems. Um, I started having some symptoms that it was something more probably about 30 years ago. Um, and there were a lot of, um, we, we just recently moved um, from Atlanta to Delaware and um, in packing up the house um, where we had raised our family, I found a lot of my old medical records that I really hadn't looked at. And that's when I discovered that there had been a whole lot of notes from doctors over 25 years that said, possible Crohn's disease discussed with patient and it had never happened. So I was not diagnosed until February 8th, 2016. Going that's, all that time. Yes. That's so uh, wild. Yeah. Yeah. By the time they diagnosed me, um, the surgeon said that the Crohn's was moving so rapidly. If they had not have opened me up, I wouldn't have made it. What kind of surgery did you have done? Did they remove part of the colon? They, well, they, I, I had already had a resection and that was because of, they, they, it has a name now. I don't remember what it's called. It starts with an E. Um, and so I had already had a resection to try to help me be able to use the bathroom better. And that was in 2008. So on um, February 1st, 2016, um, after basically threatening people and saying, I'm dying. You cannot send me home again from the hospital. I sent my purse with everything, everything I had except for my driver's license home with my husband and from the hospital. And I said, no matter what you do, don't come back. It doesn't matter what they tell you. Don't come back. They have to treat me. They will have to do something if you do this. And what they agreed to do was give me an ileostomy, which I had been asking for. When they opened me up, they discovered that everything in there had so much had been eaten. Wow. And so at the end, when I woke up from the surgery, not only did I have, actually it was a colonoscopy. When I woke up, I had an ileostomy because they had removed the rest of my colon, half my rectum and a big chunk of my small intestine. And that was where things just kind of went. And that's where the hospital surgery, emergency room, blah, 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 all that started. That on And that was in... 2008 or was that, that in 2016 was 2016 the wow. that surgery was um i found out that, that was february 1st 2016 i got the diagnosis and all of that february 8th 2016 at six o'clock in the morning one of the things i find so frustrating and disappointing is that there's so many stories like yours where you don't get a diagnosis that people with ibd were just were left on our own for so many years and we don't know what kind of damage it's doing in that time. And then we're left to navigate it on our own. And that, that's exactly what happened. So tell me about your journey. How did you manage? First, how did you manage your the disease that you didn't even know you had? How did you manage it for so many years? And then what changed after 2016 when you finally had the diagnosis? Did, did you start doing different things then? 
Um, yes and no. Um, I So I had started getting sick about 20 years before that. And um, it turned out that I had um, I had, had Epstein Barr, the Epstein Barr virus, and it became chronic, meaning that there was mitochondrial damage. So I had been searching for a very long time for a way to get better from that. And I also have Hashimoto's, and um, that was another one um, because. I, Synthroid doesn't work well for everyone. And um, I don't believe I ever absorbed it well. So my thyroid levels had always gone up and down. And I had always gone between hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism from the age of 28. From the age. Yeah. So I had been searching for decades for a solution to some, to this stuff because like, no, there was never another form of thyroid medication that was offered to me. There was never anything from a GI other than um, eat more fiber. And that, that doesn't even help no, <laughs> all of us no, with IBD. <laughs> <laughs> worse. Um, so, um, I, so I had, so when I found out, I had a really good um, base to, to start with. However, I did start with what the doctor said, what the GI said, and that meant medication. And that's when I found out that I cannot take the medication. I was either allergic or intolerant to it after um, anaphylactic shock and some other <laughs> things. I said, okay, I can't do this. And, and I knew, and a, a lot of that came from just being, having a lifetime of GI issues and being put on different medications and different supplements. And by the time I got there, my body had just said, no, no more. And at this point, there's next to nothing prescription I can take. And there's also very few supplements I can take as well. What I really have is diet and exercise for myself. And that's so that's where that started was my realizing that I was truly on my own with this and that not only that, but I was going to be fighting against a medical system that doesn't like people like me. They can't help me. And there's too many people like me out there who we either are intolerant to the medication. We build antibodies to the biologics. There's a whole lot. I know a whole lot of people who have built antibodies to the biologics or where they just don't work too. That's called irretractable. And the, these things, so you go through that and it simply doesn't work. And at some point for people like that, you have to also say, am I going to really go through this one more time? You know, and all the side effects of that. And so there's this whole subgroup of people like me out there and we, we, we scare everybody. The doctors don't know what to do if, if no. you don't respond to the medications. That's kind of their wheelhouse. They know that's how to it. they know how to do surgery, prescribe medicines, and it's not a not a knock on them per se. I mean, the no. human body is so complex yes. that when you don't respond, they don't know how to deal with the diet and exercise part. They're, right, they're lost. Right. And, and and like I said, I can't even take most supplements. So there, there was a supplement I found out about from you. Actually, <laughs> this was probably 2017. It was, it was a long time ago. And I don't remember which one it was, but it's maybe L-glutamine. I was taking a lot of L-glutamine for a while. I, I do take l -glu I do take L-glutamine now. This was, um, it was like turmeric ginger. It was, one of the, yeah. And, um, I tried that and it was the concentrated forms of those just spices in the capsule. And that's why I said, I can't even do that anymore. My body truly was like, forget it. You, you have done too much, you know, and it wasn't even my fault. This is just the way it was. And I, and I realized I was going to have to either figure this out or I was not going to make it. So tell me about that process. How did you figure it out? Uh, Cause you've done a few different things with your diet. Um, so stuff, talk to yeah. me, yeah. talk to me about what you did, because you look like you're in a great spot now, watching you on Instagram and looking at you, speaking with you now, you look like you're vibrant and healthy. So how did you, how did you get here? Well, um, I, through making a whole lot of mistakes in the beginning, um, there's two other things that were happening during this time. One was I had C. diff that was undiagnosed for nine months. 
that was a lot of the problem. That's actually what was killing me was a C. diff. I, I kept going to the emergency room. I was in the emergency room at Emory University every week like this. And they would just keep sending me home. And what, ha what, what happened was I had a bladder infection. I'm a catheter user and as well. Um, and my kidneys, my bladder doesn't pulse. My body just refuses to do what it's supposed to do. And so I'm a catheter user. So I tend to get, I tend to get UTIs and kidney infections as well. And um, my doctor forgot, forgot for just nine months to take a culture. And so he kept putting me on all these different antibiotics for the UTI and the UTI was getting worse and worse and worse. And then I started having this explosive poo and they just kept sending me home. Doctors kept sending me home. Nobody oh would. And, and I know that this, this was like one of those real, what is wrong with all of you? Nobody would listen to me. Not one person would listen. Not one doctor. I mean, nothing about that sounds normal or okay. It's not. Like that needs an answer. That's why I was so desperate, Stephanie. I was so desperate. I mean, for me to have to, I was threatening people. I was calling every support I could. Um, I, I mean, I was threatening to get an attorney because I was dying and I knew I was dying and I was. Wow. Yeah. And I that I lost so much faith. And now I don't have a lot of faith at all in the medical system. How could you? I mean, yeah. anyone with that experience would, I just, it blows oh. my mind. I mean, I know that even in my experience, I've been dismissed and, you know, pushed aside and I hear it frequently, but to be that, that blatantly, I mean, something was wrong. Right. Every, nobody would do anything. And what finally happened was I went to, this was back to Emory. Again, we, we lived really close to Emory and um, went back to Emory and a doctor in the emergency room finally took a culture. And that's, and that's how I got rid of the UTI nine months later. And that, that was December, 20, 2015. And um, by January, I was like, I hate to put it like this, but I was, I was like half dead. I mean, I, I could barely move because, I mean, everything in my body was depleted from nine months of losing all that fluid. I was horribly dehydrated, I, you know, and nobody would pay attention to that. And um, God, I'm sorry, just the memory, actually the memory, I hadn't thought about that for years. And yeah, the it's really distressing thinking about, you know, and, and then, and then even though they had made a big mistake, the GIs had made a big mistake, there was no recognition. There was no apology. There was nothing. They, all they said was, well, now you need to start taking a biologic. And I'm like, you really think I'm listening to you now? You know, and I, but I still did, you know, um, and that, that's when I discovered that no, I, I, I was on my own. Literally, I was on my own. I had, um, I had doctors telling me I was stupid telling me I was going to die. I would die. I would die. I had a doctor tell me I was going to be in a nursing home in 2017. I had a doctor tell me I was going to be in a nursing home within less than 10 years. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm training for a strong man competition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a heart. I mean, it's yeah. heartbreaking to just, I mean, it's not, it's so obvious you needed help. I, that it's, baffles me. I don't even know what to say other than it's heartbreaking and it's it's shocking. So you lose faith in the medical system. I have I have nothing. And, I have I have next to nothing. And what happened what happened since then? That was 2015. The okay, C diff so, gets recovered. You get surgery. Yeah. Uh, they finally diagnosed 2016. Yeah. IBD. They had to. You've been left on your own and you're not in a nursing home. You are vibrant and healthy. You just mentioned training for a, a strong man. <laughs> How'd you get here? <laughs> well, the first thing I did was um, with FODMAP, I, I started doing, finding the people who had contributed to that. And I started sending emails out all over the world to doctors begging for help. 
And that was my first thing that I did where I took some, where I took all my power and I said, I, you people here in Atlanta, you people are going to kill me. So I went outside of Atlanta. At that point we weren't, you know, we've moved recently. At that point we hadn't moved. We weren't even thinking about moving. And that was the first thing. So I got a lot of information from doctors all over the world, really, because they, they responded. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I, w- I feel very fortunate. The number and the number of doctors who actually were so helpful and nice, but they were in other other countries. I, I mean, I got I got them from the stuff from the doctors in India, Australia. There's a lot from Australia because, well, that's where FODMAP. Oh, I is. didn't know that. Yeah, I think so. Where it originated. I think Mon- Monarch Universe. Mon- Monarch. I, I'm probably not mm-hmm. saying it right. Anyway, I, I did. So they were they were they were everywhere, and I am beyond grateful to these people who responded and helped. there's some good ones out there <laughs> there are there there are there are some really good doctors out there and there and there are really good people out there too you know I just um, I think in this country because of the way that it is between insurance and pharmaceutical and doctor and that's what that's triangle um doctors have become very stymied as well in what they can do they have. And um, if it's not a prescription, I think especially in the U.S. here, if it's not a prescription, if it's not a procedure, if it's not one of those things, they don't know what to do. So after after you reach out to all these physicians around the, around the world, really, um, how did that start shaping your diet and your lifestyle? Well, I started discovering a lot better what I could and couldn't consume. And I, I realized kind of quickly that my body had a host of food intolerances that were contributing to the symptoms I was having that I didn't even realize. I was a vegan going up to this. I had been a vegan or vegetarian from age 16 to age 50. And a lot of the problem was that, that the the foods that I was eating Really, unfortunately, um, because being you know beans with lectins and you know um, the difficulties that the human body can have with digesting um, the skins, the lectins in it, um, whether or not it's properly prepared, that's something that people need to find out for themselves. And I discovered really rapidly that I could no longer consume the foods that I was used to consuming. And that meant I was going to have to start eating meat. And then, so I, I started doing some real research and some real thinking into what I had believed about um, meat and how animals are raised at that point. This is now getting close to 2018. Um, and when I did, I discovered that how many animals are um, killed on any farm that who aren't cute. They're just not cute, but they still have every right to live. If you, you know, if you say this cow has a right to live, well, so do all the insects and rodents and birds and reptiles, you know, who are, who are killed and torn to shreds with farming equipment every day. I mean, it's over a million on, on a medium sized farm every single day. So nothing, I mean, no matter what you do, there's going to be suffering. And so I focus on purchasing my food from smaller farms now, small farms and farmers who I know. And that was the biggest thing that happened right there. And is that about the time, because you and I, we were actually starting to do carnivore together. So is that right about the time that you started to research um, the different farms, the nutrients that are in meat, realizing you couldn't be vegan anymore? Well, this is kind of, it's kind of interesting. So I, I started, I started lifting weights in 1996. Um, in the year 2000, I actually discovered carnivore. Really? I, I tried it. Way it before it was trendy. <laughs> I tried it. I tried it. I couldn't, I, I did. I, I wasn't eating red meat. I did fish. I just did fish. And I did it because I wanted to do a strongman competition. <laughs> oh, all the way back. <laughs> and I was trying to increase my athleticism. And I knew that strong men ate meat. That's what they did. They ate meat. They drank, 
milk and they took liver pills. And so that's yes, what yes. I did. And there was a group, Charles Washington. Um, he yeah. is now on Facebook. You, you know what I'm talking Yeah. I he do. Had a, right. This started in 2000 with Charles Washington's group on Reddit. And that's where I found it for the first time. I did this for a few months and I didn't like it, mostly because I'm not a big fish eater. So I went back to what I was doing before and kind of moved on. Yeah. So that was where I first found it. So when it came up again at the end of 2017, I was like, oh, I know what that is, you know, and then I started like talking to people and I joined some support groups on Facebook and that's where I was like, okay, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And I, I did. So, and I did. And that's where um, the recovery really started. And the big thing there, besides getting it into remission quickly, is I have a condition called short gut that from the surgeries. And at the time I weighed about 80 pounds. Yeah. And there are pictures of me. I put the pictures up to show people that I have been very, I have been everything from 80 pounds to 200 pounds and and in between. The big thing there when I first started carnivore was I started gaining weight. So what, um, what they say is that your small intestine opens up and can start absorbing food when you remove those toxins. And I did, I gained over 30 pounds very quickly actually once it started healing and i could see it it was amazing and i still have that now i still have that now and that's one of the biggest things is i can keep weight on me now i can't gain a lot of weight but i can keep weight on me now and i am a normal weight that's good 80 yeah. is not healthy and normal <laughs> unless you're what 10 years old <laughs> I don't think I was but, 80. I don't think I was that thin when I was 10. Yeah. <laughs> so what kind of foods were you eating? Were you 100% carnivore? What what kind of foods were you eating? What was that yeah. diet? I went off the deep end. I was a ribeyes and water only. I did ribeye and water um, for six months. And how quickly did you start feeling your energy coming back, feeling better, um, start feeling that healing process happening? Really fast. Actually, it was a couple of weeks. I didn't even have a lot of withdrawals, honestly. But by then, I, I, I mean, I had cut wheat out of my diet. I already knew I, you know, so a lot of some of that stuff simply wasn't there. I was surprised, though. Uh, and now, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I did. And I was so sick at the time. I don't know that I really would have known the difference, honestly. Um, so, yeah. And what are you doing now? Are you still carnivore, 100% carnivore? Have you adapted that a little bit? And how long did that take? That was 2017. You really started to dive into it. Yeah. What's um, happened since then? I am now, uh, I call myself an opt opportunistic omnivore mm -hmm. it, because it changes day to day. If I need, I pay attention. I keep a food log so I can tra track my symptoms and I pay attention to what my body is telling me. And I, if I have a side effect to something, even if it's something that I normally eat, I'll take it back out and put it back in to test it, to see. So I, I do, uh, um, as I am also post, obviously I'm fairly long postmenopausal. menopausal um, It's been almost 20 years. And so I, I also eat to optimize my hormones and I eat a high fat, moderate protein, moderate carb diet. Um, I don't eat any, I try not to eat grains very much. And I try to have my starchy carbs come from vegetables and I prepare them in a certain way to get as much of the starch out as I can. I believe that the problem with all of this stuff is starch, that our bodies don't do well with unfermented starch. Fermented starch is good for your gut, but unfermented starch, our bodies, I don't think our bodies really know what to do with it. So that was one, two, I avoid anything that's a vegetable oil or a seed or a nut like the plague because of the amount of pain it causes me and the bloating and digestive issues. Uh, I think one of my biggest things is going to be vegetable oils. I'm actually starting a book about it. Awesome. Yeah. 
Be sure to let me know when it comes out, and I will share it. Believe me, Stephanie, you're going to know when it comes out. Good, good. Yeah. (laughs) So tell me about your fitness journey. Um, You started, uh, you had the desire for a strong man way back when. You started lifting weights in 1996, which, funny enough, that's about when I started lifting weights, too, 96, 97. I got a VHS tape, and it was... In Shape with Rachel McClish. And so I don't know if anyone is going to know who Rachel McClish was, but she was, I think, the first female bodybuilder, Olympian. But it was... Oh, that's where I know her name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and... I really love the sport. Mm-hmm. And I follow, I've been following the sport forever. Because I think that, I think that what they do is just unbelievable, you know, what, what it takes to do that. I, I wouldn't do that. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need. It's, uh, it's intense. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely need to eat. Yeah. So, tell me about your journey. You started lifting weights. Had the desire for the strong man. You're gonna do the strong man. You're training for it now. So, yeah, it's, talk um, to me it's about New Jersey. That. So, um, I started. I found a gym. I had never been to a gym. Um, I had a two year old, and we had just moved into the house we just moved out of, and. Um, I saw a sign that said free childcare after four. And I was, I was a high school special ed teacher and I was like, Oh, I could use some free childcare. So that's how I wound up joining a gym. And I thought, Oh, I'll walk on the treadmill. And they gave me a free tour. And that's how I started lifting weights. That's I, awesome. And I don't know that I ever got on a treadmill. Yeah. <laughs> and that gym, all I wanted was to pick up heavy stuff and put it down because it felt good. And my mind was clear. At yeah. Call. When I it did does it. feel good. Yeah. So that's actually how that started. And yeah, I fell off the deep end from the very beginning. Um, with all the years of being sick, I was actually quite sick for after that, starting in a, like um, 2000, uh, 2005. I, I mean, that's about when the Epstein Bar thing started. And one of the things that I did to motivate myself to keep going and get and looking to get well was I would always tell myself, you're going to go back to the gym. You're going to go back to the gym. When you do that, it was like, the, there's, I mean, I don't need chocolate cake. I need weights to feel good. And so that was what I always did to motivate myself. So that now I, I did start out ahead with all of this, um, but because I still have issues, pain issues, um, issues with not feeling well, there are also periods of time where I simply can't exercise and I don't. So to, I'm hope, so to a certain extent, I'm always kind of starting over. I just had one where I didn't exercise for three months and now I'm back. And that's okay. I think it's important to learn to listen to our bodies. We know when we need that period of rest or we know when we need to change things up and, and then just as you did, you can jump right back into it when you've had time for your body to rest or heal or whatever it was that caused that break, you can get right back into it. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me, because I'm kind of guessing that because you are, you're a certified nutritionist, trainer, NLP practitioner, how does all of that play into this story? Because I'm guessing from all of the research and being left on your own to figure this out for so many years that that probably influenced where you're at now and in going in those directions? Yeah. So I was a special ed teacher and I'm also a school psychologist. Um, so I, as a special ed teacher, I taught inner city. I taught kids who were with severe behavior disorders, meaning that what that means is that very often my job actually was physical because they, of the, um, them getting out of control. Um, so that that's a whole other thing. <laughs> that's a whole. <laughs> that's a whole other thing. podcast. No, well, I have. I, yeah, for somebody else. But I, I have. <laughs> but I've always been a rehab person, and so coming. So that's where a lot of that came for me with this business. Is I had always been a rehab person, and in my head, I'm always looking to fix things. You know. So as I've gotten older. And I'm looking around me and seeing other people my age and older. Um, I'm looking at the pain issues that they have and the injuries that they have. And 
while I have pain issues, my pain issues come more from fibromyalgia and things like that. I don't have injuries. I don't have a lot of the problems that people have. And it's because I have kept myself in good shape. But I also have seen that everybody, if you, if what you did was you started writing right now and you did what you needed to do to remediate those injuries or the fibromyalgia, if you, if you work to re reduce or, you know, completely, you know, decrease the inflammation in your body as much as you can through diet and exercise, that stuff resolves just as well as if you had started in the nineties, like I did. And anybody can be where they are right now. And so that's my excitement. My passion is seeing people get better. I love it. One thing that pops into my head right now is you just did a post the other day about osteoporosis and building bone density and, and improving that. And that's huge, especially because for IBD, osteoporosis is, is a common side side effect, side indicator, whatever the term is, but a lot of people with IBD suffer with that. Can I talk about osteoporosis? Right yes. There? I'll, I'll, let me tell you why. I, when you have IBD um, or an autoimmune, is actually autoimmune. And the reason is I, um, osteoporosis is actually an inflammatory illness. And IBD, of course, is considered the most inflammatory of all the autoimmune, and it's because it's a body-wide inflammation that's, you know, as opposed, I mean, all, all autoimmune illnesses cause a system-wide inflammation. All, they all do, but Crohn's is the one that causes the most. That's why we get the teeth problems, the eye problems, we lose our hair. I mean, all the net whacked out stuff that happens with it, and that's why. So osteoporosis is inflammatory, number one. Number two, people with Crohn's disease very often have food absorption issues. And that means that you, we don't get the nutrients into our bones that we need. So that's two, number three. People with Crohn's disease tend to have their gallbladder out. Hormones are made in the bile from the gallbladder. And if you don't substitute that and support your system so that your body can continue to make your natural hormones, you're going to lose them. And that's another reason. So if you're, it doesn't matter if you're female or male, if you don't have the bile that you need to create estrogen, you can't, you don't have, or testosterone, you don't have what you need to support your bones. That's interesting. I didn't know that yeah. about the gallbladder. And a lot of people have their gallbladders removed. It's, yes. it's often viewed as like this extra organ, which it's not. I no. know my, <laughs> my sister had hers out when she was probably in her twenties. It was no, no, I was 28. And so I had my gallbladder out. And two years later, I had Hashimoto's. And that's where it all started. And I truly believe that it all started with my gallbladder being taken out and nobody telling me I needed to start supplementing for the bile. So tell me about the Longevity Blueprint. That's your business now. Yeah. You're helping women, um, I think women and men, but I think yes. you specialize helping with women. And yeah. So talk to me about that, how this all came together when you started it, um, because you're bringing so much knowledge and information about the body, about training, improving our health into what you do now. I'm trying. <laughs> Thanks. I'm trying. It's, it's really a mission. For me, I, I don't want anyone to ever be as sick as I was like that and feel as just lost and alone like that. And I, I just feel like that's becoming so common now. Um, so the, the business itself started um, December of 2021 is when I came up when I decided I was going to do this. I was going to come out. I was retired. I was going to come out of retirement and I was going to do something that I had always dreamed of doing. And luckily my husband supported me <laughs> with it. Coughed up the money for it too. <laughs> <laughs> Good for him. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, that it started there. It's I've called it the longevity blueprint because it is, this is, it's a map to tell you uniquely and personally how to have quality of life as well as length of life. It's different for everybody. I don't, I don't have a CAN program. Um, I do have programming that's 
teach a specific skills, but on the whole, just about everything is individualized for that reason, because we're all different. Just like you said, our bodies are symphonies. And if we don't, if we don't keep that balance in some way, we're going to have these kinds of problems. And you mentioned earlier to me, you said you're a functional nutritionist. You've got a few different certifications. Talk to me about when those came into your journey. Yeah. So I did precision nutrition. Um, I have um, precision nutrition one. I'm also, I've got a lot of certifications from there. I've got intermittent fasting, keto. I even did vegan, um, I, metabolic health, digestive health. There, there's a lot. I did. I, I think I just kind of went through and did all their food. <laughs> Check <laughs> them all <laughs> off. <laughs> it was easy and, well, it's easy to do. And I, and I knew a lot about it because I, I've spent so much time learning about food because I was really convinced from the very beginning that food was at the core of everything. And it was. It's fuel. It's the new yeah. nutrition we need to fuel our bodies. It's Yeah. 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 It's everything. And our food quality Food quality is the key. I truly believe that food quality is the key, that if everybody really just put down the ultra-processed carbs and the seed oils and factory meat and vegetables and just try to get, looked at getting the best quality food you can in your body, everybody would feel so much better and these illnesses wouldn't be there. This So much of this, I believe, is caused by what is being fed to the animals in farms like that, as well as what's being put or not put on the soil and our plants. And I, I just, I, 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 I don't, I don't feed that. I don't feed them. <laughs> they don't feed me. <laughs> You're still going to the small local farms and yeah. Getting yeah, I sure do. I, yeah. yeah. Even that was one of the first things I did when we moved here was I, I located them. So That's I would know. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Tell me a little bit about NLP because it's something that I know, I know very little bit, little bit about. Um, I kind of stumbled upon it a few years ago because I was doing a lot of meditation, mindfulness. Yeah. And then I heard about this thing called NLP and on Amazon, I bought this little deck of cards, NLP uh, deck, but I don't know a whole lot about it. So I want to hear uh, from you what it is uh, and how do you do you bring that into the longevity longevity mm -hmm. blueprint? Is that a part of it? I sure do. Yeah. So the so my business is divide I, into three areas. We do physical fitness, nutritional fitness, um, and that's the functional nutrition and then mindset and habit formation. And I, I did actually work as a therapist and I still volunteer as a crisis counselor for the crisis text line. So I've, I, I like doing that stuff too. I'm one of those people that I just, I, 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 I get interested in things. I have ADHD. And so I, one of my superpowers with ADHD is that I get really super interested in stuff and then I have to learn everything I can about it. And then I go to something else, I'll learn, you know, and so that's honestly, I truly, I think that if I didn't have that, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> You've been, it's innate. It's part of you. Yes. You just learn everything about everything. <laughs> so that, that's kind of where it started. I discovered NLP in the 70s. Really? Honestly, yeah, with Bandler and Grinder, and I, I had their books in the seventies. I thought the idea was fascinating. This idea that you could change the way, change the way that you looked at things. It's not even it's not changing the way you think. It's changing perception. So, for example, with NLP, it so say we'll we'll do a bad memory. Say you've got a traumatic memory. What NLP does, it removes the emotion from it. So you're not looking at it like that anymore. So it doesn't, it, nothing can change what happened, but you can change how you perceive something and how you, um, whether or not you punish yourself for something that something that somebody else did. To me, the ruminating thoughts that come with trauma is self-punishment. Because there, nobody's there, you know, you have, but you have those thoughts, you're remembering it and you're going over and over and over with it. It's punishment. 
it it causes physical emotional distress you know so i and because i do um you know as some obviously i think i think all of us with autoimmune stuff especially severe stuff we all have trauma in our past and i do i do it from starting at the age of three and so i was always been very interested in finding out how to shut my head up and having adhd made that even worse, you know, and it was just, I mean, it was very difficult for me to focus because of that kind of, of that, those kind of thoughts. And so finding that was my first step towards that kind of emotional and mental freedom that I needed. And I wanted to, um, wanted to be able to share that with people, but I also wanted to know more for myself so I could help myself. So that, that's how, that's how I fell into it. I did um, I did do some of the Tony Robbins stuff in the eighties. Um, I wish that he would give credit to Bandler and Grinder about it. I know I'm going to get a lot of hate for that, but he doesn't. And I, it bothers me. So I'm not a big, I, I'm not a Tony Robbins proponent because of that. Um, and you bring that knowledge and practice into the longevity blueprint. Does yeah, that so life coaching? I, and I'm kind of guessing with that, like the self punishment. I know a lot of us will feel that way about food or even our illness. Like, did I bring this on? Was it something I did back then? Or what am I eating? It, I shouldn't have ate that. Is that? Am I correct in guessing that that's a part of it and one of the ways in which oh, this yeah. plays into? Yeah. Plays yes. into it. All autoimmune illnesses need three things for them to actually manifest. It needs a biological reason, it needs an external reason, and a genetic. So the biological and the genetic are two different things. So for example, with Hashimoto's, there was um, a biological thing that was actually how I was eating, because I was at that time it was a raw food vegan. That tipped off the genetic part and then the trauma. And at that time, when at that time when I had that diagnosis, oh, and then also I had my gallbladder out. And thyroid hormone is a hormone. And that so that also depletes it. Um, at that time, I was having a lot of flashbacks and memories when I was in my late 20s. And that's what I think tipped that off. That's true for every autoimmune illness, it really does take three, those, all three of those things for it to happen. And that's why I believe that's why people who have lived through trauma tend to get autoimmune stuff. And it's because you got that third one there that caused it. I've read that a lot. Um, there's a lot of research about it and just having that, oh, that yeah. trigger where it's typically that environmental trigger, the trauma, it's something that it's that third, it's the third item and it triggers the cascade of sends, sends right. our body going haywire. You do a tailspin. So, yeah. You do a tailspin. That's and that, what and, I was looking and for. I think you're absolutely right, Stephanie, that that is self punishment. We, we've got to get off the roller coaster of punish, literally punishing ourselves for things that somebody else did, you know? Um, and that's been the, biggest healing for me has been that, has been starting to understand that I wasn't responsible for any of that. I was told I was, but I wasn't responsible for it. I'm not responsible for the stuff that doctors did. I was told, but I'm not. I have, I'm, and those, I had to understand what my part was in what had happened to me. And it wasn't what I was told. And I, that when I learned that, I was able to let it go. And yeah, NLP and other cognitive behavioral forms of treatment really did help me. But honestly, I, it was all me. I could never find, no kidding, I could never really find any a therapist who, um, in terms of that, really knew what to do. And it seemed like it was so much, you know, maybe that, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. Now, I, I, I have, I'm not saying I haven't had good experiences with therapists because I have just not with that kind of therapy, that kind of therapy I've had to do on my own. What kind of advice would you give for someone who might be in a similar situation where they're frustrated with doctors or frustrated with the care they're getting? They're not getting the care they needed. You know, it's not the right, it's not the right therapy. It's not the right gastroenterologist. It's not the right hospital. 
you've been in all those situations. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who might be listening and feeling like they're in that same spot? For me, um, I, I honestly, I hit rock bottom. Um, I, the day that happened, I was in the CCU. I came in to the ER the night before in full kidney failure and my organs were shutting down. This was the second time that it happened. And I had asked my husband to let me go because I simply couldn't stand how sick and the amount of pain I was in anymore. And I was told no. The next day, um, I was in the CCU um, and I wasn't dying anymore, but I decided I was not going to do this anymore and that I needed to take my, the power back in my life. And that whether I sank or swam, I wasn't gonna do it anymore. I was getting off the roller coaster. And that was a decision. That was actually my birthday, 2017, November 23rd, 2017. I didn't tell anybody, I didn't tell my husband, my son. I didn't tell any, I just made a decision. This is what I was going to do and sink or swim. I was either gonna get better or I was gonna die. But if I died, it was not gonna be because of what I, what I was being told to do. And that is actually when I got better, started getting better. Yeah. Wow. What an incredible journey that you've had. I mean, looking at you in so much health and just vibrant and fun and laughing and talking, you would never you would never imagine the journey and the struggles and the mountains that you've climbed in the past to be where you're at now. Thank you. That's really that that means a lot to me. It does because I don't I don't want to be a walking victim like that I because I was I was I you know and I don't I don't choose to put that kind of energy out anymore that's awesome so when is the strongman contest October 3rd in Atlantic <laughs> City in New Jersey <laughs> yeah, awesome. yeah so I just I rejoined we we live in a our neighborhood has a gym and I can't really train for it there so I'm joined a gym yesterday and I'm going to be videotaping this. I'll be taking people along for the ride. If you want to watch. Oh, how awesome. Yeah. Yes. What kind of events are in the strongman? Is that like the pushing the boulder and like lifting, flipping the tires and all those fun things? On the car with the rest. I can't wait. I'm so excited. Yeah. You pick up the Olympic boulder and put it. Yes. Yeah, it's the whole, it's, it's that, it's one of those, you pick up a refrigerator and make the, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know how strong I can be. I've, yeah. I, have, I have, yeah, because I've wanted to do this now for almost 25 years. And that's the reason. I have never wanted to be a bikini model or a figure competitor. I don't care. I want to be strong. I always, I want men to cross the street when they see me because they're scared, be, you know, so that I'm safe. I want to be safe. I want to wrestle a bear in the woods. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's that independence. It's the confidence right. that yes. coming, being strong and healthy and knowing that you can fight and run and jump and pick up boulders and cars. <laughs> right. It does but, a lot but, for the mindset. It does. And that and that that right there is so perfect because it does physical Focusing on your physical fitness goes into every other area of your life. Focusing now, I mean, and while we have the focus on all, you know, the emotional part and the mental part, but that doesn't translate to physical health, like physical health transfers to everything else. And so the biggest, so if you wanted a really good reason to, to go pick up a weight, you don't have to pick up a boulder, but pick up a weight, <laughs> that's it. The discipline you learn from doing that, and if and if you're like, oh, I'm so lazy, or that, go pick up a weight. You will learn. That's how you learn. Yes. That's how you learn. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have covered a lot of topics, a lot of information today. Is there something that you feel that we didn't touch on um, that you want to share with the audience? Anything you want to ask me? What's on your mind? Um. Well, Stephanie, you and I have talked... <laughs> <laughs> Not recently, but I used to chat with you quite a bit. Um, I remember, back, yeah. Back when, yeah, in the beginning. I, I The only thing I ever want to say to people is you're stronger than you think you are. 
And if you give up, you're not going to get any better. That's, that's just it. If you give up, you're not going anywhere. I, I, I believe that I believe that one of the best skills we can all have is to learn to stay focused on our future. And everybody says, you know, present moment is everything. I don't actually believe that. I believe that keeping a focus on your goals is it and just trying to blot everything else out and just being focused on where it is you want to be. You know, um, and so that that was that was that that that's my thought. I love it. And that is something that you would learn from me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So if people want to keep up with you, they want to follow your journey, watch you as you go through the strong men competition, learn more about longevity blueprint, where can they find you online? Well, um, you can follow my Instagram. Um, that's at with underscores, the longevity blueprint. Um, I have a blog on WordPress. I have a YouTube channel. I have a Facebook. Um, I do not have a website <laughs> because I, I'm the most illiterate person you've ever met. That coming from someone who just said they have a YouTube, they have a blog, they have Instagram. They- <laughs> Plus, no, you're posting con. You post content. I mean, almost daily. I think, and it's yeah, it's wonderful yes, content. Thank you. Yeah, and I watch thank you post you. it. I'm like, I ne- I'm like, I need to be like Stephanie, and I need to post more and yeah. do great things, but. You're sharing a lot of wonderful information. Um, I will put all of the links to all of those things in our show notes so that people can find them easily. Is there any any last words you want to share before we close? Just thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share the story. I've never really shared this story like this before, and I was actually really uncomfortable doing it because it seems like it's just so overwhelming. And this was nice, honestly. That was I'm, I'm, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Thank you. And I'm very grateful for you for sharing your story because I know a lot of us with stories, you know, they are uncomfortable stories and they're not things that we necessarily enjoy talking about. But it's so, I've said it multiple times, like going through my journey, I relied so heavily on the stories of other people and the fact that other people were willing to share their experiences and what they were going through because it's a whole different thing from what your doctors are going to tell you to actually hear it from someone else who's going through, maybe it's the same thing. Maybe it's not exactly the same, but maybe it's similar. That gives us strength and hope and focus on the future that we can carry on knowing that someone else has been through this. I can get through it too. So I'm very grateful for you for sharing your story today. And thank you for coming on. Thank Thank you for listening to the Crohn's Fitness Food Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have an IBD story, either as a patient or a family member, that you'd like to share as a guest on this podcast, or if you have a topic you'd like to hear about, send me an email at crohnsfitnessfood at gmail.com. And if you'd like to learn more about me and my Crohn's journey, follow me on Instagram using at crohnsfitnessfood or visit my blog, crohnsfitnessfood.com. And finally, remember, be strong, Be grateful and keep going, my fellow warriors.